I feel like almost everybody has that book. The book you first really connected with that made you feel like you weren't alone or connected you to the world. What is that book for you? Ronnie the Robber's Daughter by Astrid Lindgren. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) I think it was the first book that I read that had a female protagonist who did stuff instead of just having feelings. She was out there running around in the woods by herself and she was brave and she faced all these terrifying dangers with no fear whatsoever and she bossed the boys around she was just this powerhouse all on her own plus she gets to go live in a cave in the woods and train horses and stuff so it was just all of the (laughs) things that i desperately wanted to be that i didn't think i ever could be or maybe didn't know the girls could be and it it fundamentally changed the way that i saw myself the way that i saw the world um the way that i saw being a girl it was important I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? This is a story about a child who discovered books. And it had such a profound effect on her that she wanted to bring books to all the other children in the world. She was born in the late 1800s. It was just the beginning of the thinking that books were for children Mm. and that it could affect them. But... The really wonderful thing about this story is that everybody is coming from the same experience. The powerful role of books in childhood, and then when they get older, they want to bring books to all the other children in the world. This woman I'm going to tell you about today, her name is Mary Lemist Titcomb, and she invented the bookmobile in 1905. When she first invented it, it was a horse-drawn carriage. She designed it so that it could reach deep into the Blue Ridge Mountains and reach all of the farm kids out there who lived so far away they could never make it into the library. Oh, right. So I interviewed My name is Charlie Mullins Glenn. I live in Pleasant Grove, Utah. I'm an independent scholar and I'm a, a writer. Anything else? You literally wrote the book I on literally Mary. I wrote the book on Mary Lemus <laughs> Titcomb. So she was born in 1852 in Farmington, New Hampshire, and um, her par- her father was a farmer. They didn't have a lot of money. And it's this industrial town, and they just have tons and tons of factories manufacturing shoes. So she is this quintessential working class girl in a nowhere kind of place, way mm. off in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. It's the kind of place where people felt like, you know, there's no future here. You're gonna work in the factories just like your parents always did. But she discovered books as a child. It seems like it launched her into a new universe. She was going to take her life in a different direction. Her parents, they actually moved out of that town to send her brothers to school. And it just so happened that nearby, there was actually an excellent girls' school, Mm. which had been set up entirely by a private donor who said, Girls' education is way too much of the fanciful. We just teach them to sew and sing, and that's pointless, and their education should be as good as boys. So she had an educational background that very few women did at that time, particularly of her class. When her brothers started leaving home and starting their own careers, she wanted to do something too. She wasn't content just to stick around, and, you know, she had ambitions. The career options were you could be a teacher or you could be a nurse, mm-hmm. and that was pretty much it. I feel like she's kind of a fiery, spunky character. She didn't have the patience to be a teacher, and she didn't like blood, and she couldn't be a nurse. But she had heard that there was this new field open to women, librarianship. librarianship. And that it tr- intrigued her because she was a bookworm, and so she decided she wanted to become a librarian. But at that point, there, there was no formalized training. So she decided she would just have to do an apprenticeship, basically. Her brother, George, was living in Concord, Massachusetts. Mary moved in with him and his wife and did an apprenticeship, basically, at the Concord, Massachusetts Library. And then she was able to get a job uh, in Rutland, Vermont. She quickly became known throughout the state of Vermont as an excellent organizer of libraries. So it's pretty cool because this career choice of hers could only have happened... Right then. Had she been born six or eight years earlier, her choices would have been much more limited. As far as her personality goes, 
some of her colleagues described her alert in manner, effective in results. Her belief in whatever she undertakes stimulates all about her into hearty cooperation. And this everywhere is the secret of her success. Her passport application in 1907 was really fascinating. This was before she went on an extended trip to Naples and some other areas. But I guess when you had to fill out a passport in 1907, you had to give age, stature, forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, chin, hair, complexion, face. So they didn't have pictures, Hmm. so you had to try to describe yourself. Hmm. So this is the way she described herself. But she gave her age as 50, forehead broad, eyes gray, nose snub, mouth large, chin oval, hair gray, complexion fair, face oval. So I thought that was kind of interesting. (laughs) There was a a new public library opening up in Maryland. And this was like the first county funded public library. The people of Maryland were like, the whole county is going to fund this and we're going to bring in the greatest librarians and she applied from New England and said I've done this for years I know how it's done I can come and launch your library so uh, she got hired but she recognized quickly that it was just the townspeople that were coming Mm -hmm. and she said no this is a this is a county library it needs to serve the entire county I'm sure it was because of her childhood experience with books like she wanted to bring books to the rural children way out in the boonies the world was never going to come to them and they were never going to get out and see the world but she wanted them to have the same experience that she had so she opened up this children's room and that was very popular she had remote library stations that she would set up like in post offices and it would just be a box like a drop box that she would fill in and then people would come and drop books there but even then the people way out there they didn't bother they you know they probably didn't really care And it wasn't worth the journey just to get a dumb old book. So uh, she decided that if... Well, if the people can't come or won't come to the library, let's take it to them. So her invention in 1905 was to take a wagon and specially adapt it to hold masses of books but they actually called it the book contraption she kitted it out and she had specially constructed shelves to fill it with books and then she was going to send it off into the blue ridge mountains she couldn't drive it for two reasons she's a woman and it's generally considered to not be a womanly thing to drive a cart around But also she was an outsider and she knew it. And if she just rolls up in this wagon in the Blue Ridge Mountains, nobody's going to have any interest in her. So she hired the library's janitor, this really old Civil War vet from the region. His name was Joshua Thomas. She put him in charge of the book, Contraption. In the 1910 census, I found Joshua Thomas and he had listed his occupation as book missionary. That's what he called himself. I love that. So that's kind of, he saw it as a calling, you know, isn't that awesome? (laughs) There's a funny story that she tells when she wrote about it later. Um, about as they pulled up with this the new book contraption in front of one farmhouse, she heard a voice call out, we don't need the dead wagon here, take it away. And she realized it looked like, you know, the, the local mortician's wagon. <laughs> and so she thought, okay, we're going to have to fancy it up a little bit. So they painted the wheels bright red and, and made it a little more um, appealing, <laughs> not quite so bare bones. Her philosophy was that books were for everyone, for women as well as men, for the poor as well as the rich, for absolutely everyone. I think that it was that whole idea of democratization and how books um, and education uh, can be the great levelers. What do you think the book represented to Mary Titcomb, or books in general? I think for her personally... Books were her way to become something, even as a woman, to to do something really significant. 
access to books for all people could provide for them that same upward mobility, to use a modern term. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She definitely had a particular interest in getting those books to those children on those farms way up in the mountains. Because in a way it was... It was sort of giving the books to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So slowly this Joshua Thomas, this old man, cruising around the mountains, he he won everybody over and it became extremely popular. As the years pass, he gains everybody's interest and support. And then something still somewhat inexplicable happened. Nobody really can figure out why or how it happened. But at some point, the bookmobile got... Stuck on the train tracks, and a train smashed right into it and just blew it to smithereens. Joshua Thomas was injured. The whole great experiment was destroyed. Like, seriously? That's just that. All right, we're done? No. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What? That's how it seemed. That's what everybody thought. They're like, okay, well, there's her quirky experiment gone because there's no way we're coming up with money to do that again. We just lost all that money on the whole wagon and everything and all the books. So the great expense just gone. She set about trying to figure out how to raise funds. And finally, someone came forward again with the money to buy a book wagon. And at this point, the horseless carriage was the big Thing, and they bought a, a international harvester auto car. It could carry more books and uh, could cover more ground more quickly. And at that point, there was an assistant librarian at the library named Miss Chrisinger, who was put in charge of the oversight of the book wagon. And she spent the next 25 years with that being her primary charge. Uh, she was just completely devoted to that as well. To me, it's a real, it's kind of a striking example of um, common people really just believing in equality. Like she and so many others, they go to all this effort just to bring those books to people yeah. in the mountains. You know, like she just really believes in it. And that's what's driving her to do all this hard stuff. I can only imagine it's because of her own experience. Right. She's saying somewhere out there is that little girl who really, really needs this. Yeah, exactly. She really believes in the power of it so much that that's like, that's her mission in life to bring these books to kids. You know, the people that live, especially the women that were so isolated on some of these farms, they really looked forward to the coming of the book wagon because it meant human interaction as well as books to help, you know, pass the time. Miss Chrisinger, she really became a part of the community. She would do things like stop at a house for an afternoon and maybe stay over to help with the canning. Or like if somebody was sick, she would stay with them. You know, she's so much more than just books. She's like their link to the outside world. And she loved that so much. She did it for a full 25 years while Mary Lemons Titkin was the main librarian. Mary Lemus Titcomb started um, doing presentations and writing papers about the success of what she called the rural distribution of books. And it caught on, and many, many, many other count, not just counties, but other uh, states and cities and towns became very interested. And so book wagons started popping up in Ohio and in Montana and in all over the country. As the bookmobile caught on, everybody in the different regions of America, they adapted it for their needs. There are images of librarians, and they're almost always women in all these images. And this was like a unique, interesting niche for women in the beginning of the 20th century. For me, it seems like if you're a woman interested in adventure, Mm. like you wanted to really get out there by yourself (laughs) and do something crazy... Then a librarian, surprisingly, (laughs) was a pretty awesome career opportunity, contrary to the stereotype of sitting sternly in a library and shushing everybody. These women were on horseback in the Wild West with just bags full of books, traveling miles and miles and miles to bring books to people. Burroughs in South America, 
with packs with books that mm-hmm. go out into remote areas. In the bayou, they used houseboats to reach people who were literally inaccessible by road. So they had a bookmobile houseboat, which would just meander up the bayou and stop at every wow. house and bring them books. Camels in <laughs> some areas of the world. Kentucky seems pretty hardcore about it. They, the Kentucky actually employed 200 library employees to travel by pack horse bringing books to people. That's amazing. There's a, a little motor scooter that has a, like a little shack almost built on it uh, in Italy that goes into some of those little mm-hmm. remote areas. How wonderful. So. She was one of the pioneers in this amazing democratic movement Mm. where people decided the way to make life more fair is to get books to everybody especially those who are deep in the bayou or those who are way out in the middle of the mountains those are the people we need to bring books to the most you know it's not practical it's not cost effective you have people traveling for hundreds of miles to bring one book to one person i feel like they all must have been motivated really by the the strong belief that books were so powerful yeah. that it was worth such an effort. And to me, I'm kind of amazed that, the, that any of it got funded, that any of it existed yeah. at all, you know, because it's not private donors that are making this happen. This is like county library right. programs and stuff like that. All of this is part of the great American movement to make people more equal. Yeah. And we do that by bringing books to people, bringing them knowledge you're right. almost bringing him the world, you know, yeah. saying, hey, you, you might never leave here, but look, yeah. there's all this other stuff. stuff out there. So, yeah, that whole idea that everyone, in, I mean, this is America. This is a democracy, right? Books aren't just for the rich. Books are for everyone. How did she navigate being a woman in a man's world? That's a really good question, and I think she navigated it probably with tremendous determination and finesse. Um, I think that she just simply did not let that stop her, those barriers at all. And she won people over. One other thing that I need to say about her is that I I spent hours and hours and hours pouring over uh, period newspapers, and she was in the newspaper a lot. She was very involved in civic affairs in the town, not just as the head librarian, but she often uh, hosted luncheons. She was involved in many civic organizations. She was part of the current events club. She spoke at one point to 200 people belonging to a, a civic organization about air pollution in Hagerstown. Wow. So she had a, a wide breadth of um, interests, and she was she was very passionate and competent and very involved. Okay, but here's where the story gets really interesting, because the reason Charlie Glenn dug this whole story up in the first place was you can probably guess. She didn't have books when she was little, and someone brought her a book. Exactly. Ah. (laughs) The bookmobile brought her books. Oh, really? She lived in rural Utah. My her dad died in a mining was accident. was killed in a mining accident young. when I was five years old. My mother had seven children. And so we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have many opportunities. We lived 15 miles from the nearest town. So we didn't really have access to books. Every two weeks, the bookmobile would come to our little farming community, park in front of R.G. Ross's farm near the crossroads, and we could come with our bushel baskets, literally, and check out as many books as we wanted. And so I felt like, you know, even though I didn't have a lot of opportunities, I felt like the bookmobile brought the universe to me every two weeks. So the reason she first just became interested in Mary Lemmis Titcom at all. She was just, you know, read a mention of her in passing. She was like, wait, she invented the bookmobile that was invented by a woman? The bookmobile is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. But there's even another layer to this story because one of the books that was brought to Charlie Glenn in childhood, Hmm. which was that book for her, 
was Little Women, in which Louisa May Alcott is talking about her childhood. Little Women I read I don't know how many times as a young girl, and I was completely enraptured with Jo March, her the heroine of Little Women, and that's when I decided that I wanted to be a writer. Jo was a writer, Louisa May Alcott was a writer. We made this pilgrimage to the cemetery where she was buried, and I remember standing there with my daughter, and it was a surprisingly emotional experience for me. Uh, as I looked at, at uh, Louisa May Alcott's very small, very modest little marker, and I said aloud, without really having planned to do this, thank you, Louisa. I do what I try to do every single day because of you. And here's where these two interesting elements of the story align in a strange way, because in her research, Charlie Glenn um, found out where Mary Lemmis Ticken was buried, and it was in her brother's burial plot in uh, Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts, <gasps> which is where Louisa, Louisa May Alcott Al- is from. Exactly. Wow. So for her, that was like one of those moments, yeah. like, Uh, that they are both there in the same place. So I tracked down the cemetery supervisor, a woman named Trish uh, Tish Hopkins, and I contacted her to verify that Mary was buried there. And she looked it up and she said, yeah, it looks like she is buried here, but I don't know if she has a headstone. And I thought, what? Mm -hmm. The woman who invented the bookmobile is buried in an unmarked grave? That's just wrong on every (laughs) level. So Tish said, we've got like four feet of snow right now. So, you know, I'll I'll tromp through the snow to go see what I can see. She got back in touch with me and said, there's no headstone. Mary and her sister Lydia were both buried, both in unmarked graves. When she died Mm -hmm. in Hagerstown, Maryland... I don't think there was really anyone that took that much interest in what happened. So nobody had ever provided a headstone. Hmm. So I looked at Tish and I said, Tish, I want to, I want to raise the money for a headstone. This just isn't right. And then I looked at, and I thought we can't leave poor Lydia out. Mm -hmm. So I said, I want to raise money for both Lydia and Mary. So went to work in a, just a matter of weeks. I mean, there are a lot of book lovers in the world hmm. and who were touched by Mary's story and who themselves had been impacted by the bookmobile, who willingly donated money. And um, on May 16th, which is Mary's birthday, hmm. May 16th, 2015, I flew to Concord again to speak at the unveiling ceremony. And so Mary now has a headstone and in fact, can you hand me the book? I wanted to just read at the end of my author's note. It seemed to me an utterly beautiful and poetic stroke of serendipity that Mary Lemmis Titcomb, the mother of the bookmobile, whose story I was writing, was buried a mere stone toss from Louisa May Alcott, the person who had inspired me to write books in the first place. But there's even another layer to this, which is so rad, because at the exact same time when Mary Lemmis Ticken was just starting to be a librarian, turn of the century America, thousands of the libraries which were being built all over America were funded by Andrew Carnegie. Right. That I used to live in this small town which had a Carnegie library Mm -hmm. in it, and I have very fond memories of going there. He built 2,509 libraries all across america and he straight up funded everything about it he said you have to give me the place to build it and i will build you a library just with his own money because he believed in the power of books right guess why (gasps) because he got a book and it changed his life Mm -hmm. when he was a child he was born in scotland in complete and utter poverty Mm. but he had these like profound memories of sitting in the equivalent of the local library mm. and discovering books. And for him, it was so powerful as a child. He resolved to give books to people if he ever got rich. Wow. <laughs> so when he got old and he was like insanely yeah. rich, he's like, I'm going to give books to people. people. Wow. 
and he and he built them all over the place. And one one thing that I didn't know about um, was how many of those libraries he built in the South, because mm. li- the existing public libraries were for whites only. Right. Black people couldn't go into the library; they didn't have books. So right. he built the black communities libraries. Really? He said, "These are yours. Here's a library for you, and this is for everybody to come wow. there." Wow. For me, it raises a lot of interesting questions for my political stance because the public governments, they weren't funding libraries. Right. You know, the counties weren't saying, books are valuable, let's spend a huge amount of money to build these things. Yeah. But then Andrew Carnegie, this mega rich guy, comes along and he does it. Yep. In some ways, sometimes I have more faith in the billionaires than I do in the government. And then, of course, I've just flip flop back and forth. The right. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, every year they give $50 million to public libraries awesome. to fund computers and the internet now. It's kind of like the new way yeah. of bringing the world to people. Yeah. So he's doing the same thing with his money that the counties and the city governments won't spend money mm. on. So I love this layered story of right. all these people who discover books in childhood. And it means like so much to them that when they get older, they're like, you need books. Yeah. We need to bring books to all of the children. This, it was meant to be the great equalizer or leveler. I wonder how much it worked. I think, I guess the temptation is to want to see the scope, right? Of how many people had this happen to them. But at the same time, when you look at what she was doing, she was concerned about that one person. Right? She wasn't concerned about the scope. She was like, that kid is out there, and I'm going to get a book to her. Yeah, that me. Yeah, and that I am willing to have him drive this wagon to the middle of nowhere to that one farm that is out by itself, because that might be the kid that needs it. Children's literature, it's the most important literature that we have. It is the most critical, society-forming thing that we do, I think. For me, it was from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basilie Frank Weiler. Yes, that's another one that is a lot of people's. Mm-hmm. And it's the same things, right? A, a lot mm-hmm. of them are breaking out, running away. Yeah. Living in the forest in a cave, living in a museum under the, you know, the yep. kids Almost. doing stuff without adults in exactly. the room. Exactly. And in a way, that's exactly what. Mary Lemmis Tickton was doing in exactly. her life. You know, that is the, the message that she picked up in childhood. Right. I am going to break away and do this bold new thing yeah. that nobody told me to do and nobody thinks is possible, but I'm going to go and do it. Even though the grown-ups think it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. Mary Jo Putney said, what one loves in childhood stays in the heart forever. And I think... Hmm. That really sums up all the layers in this story. Yeah. Or like really the power of childhood to determine even when you're a billionaire like Andrew Carnegie. Right. His he could have child- done anything with that money. Yeah, that his childhood is what gave him the direction in yeah. his adulthood what to do with all of his fortune. So Mary Lemmis Titcomb stayed working in that library until she was 81 years old. <laughs> and... Right up till like months before she died, she was still working in the library. And it does also appear like she might have even lied about her age. Oh. She, she shaved off five years of her life, possibly so she could so keep she working. Could keep working. Yeah, and they wouldn't say, you're too old, go home, you're done with this. All the way until she died at age 81, she was still working at the library. Wow. I feel like this this the layers of this story show just how far the ripples can go there's there was one book in one new england town that mary lemmis titcomb read and that led to who knows how many books that so many children read including charlie glenn later on who would then write the story of the woman who started it all in the first place that's amazing i love that If you enjoyed this episode, 
please leave us a review. It really helps other people to find us. And if you want to help make more of these episodes possible, you can always click donate on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Thanks to Charlie Glenn. Music for this episode was provided by Andy Reiner and John Souza, which you can find on their album Canyon Sunrise, and Andy Reiner with Bruce Molsky and Daryl Anger, and the Berkeley World Strings conducted by Eugene Friesen. Music was also provided by film composer Jeff Kuno, who you can find at jeffkunofilmmusic.com, and bluegrass banjo music performed by Mark Nelson. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. You can find music to download and lots of relevant books on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. This episode was edited by Daniel Foster Smith, and What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson.